On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, all the way from Great Britain, let's read Mega Action, issue number one, from June of 1993. Last time on Let's Read, we checked out a Japanese gaming magazine, Mega Drive Fan, and this time we're checking out a British gaming magazine. This is Mega Action, uh, issue number one, from June of 1993. This issue was donated to the show by Darren from Osset, if I'm saying that correctly, in England, which is up in West Yorkshire. So he is sort of northwest of, uh, of Manchester. And uh, as he points out, Mega Action is not as popular as uh, other gaming magazines in the UK were, like uh, Mean Machines. But that doesn't mean that it's not a cool magazine to check out. Uh, this was published by Europress, who is probably best known, um, at least as far as gaming magazines go, best known in the UK for publishing Amiga Action. They published a number of gaming magazines, and they were all, whatever they were, actions. I think there was like Super Action and maybe GB Action for the Game Boy. And then they had, uh, I think it was ST Action for the Atari ST line uh, of home computers. But uh, today we're talking about Mega Action, which, if the title doesn't tell you, is uh, a Mega Drive focused or Mega Drive exclusive, really, as it says here, 100% Mega Drive uh, magazine. The first thing that really strikes me about the cover is the price. It's only 99p, which is about a pound, which would translate into about uh, you know a dollar fifty, uh, you know, in U.S. dollars at the time, which is crazy cheap for a magazine. And it had me thinking, like, well, is that just what Europress did? Like, they sold their magazines cheap to, like, undercut the competition? And no, Amiga Action still sold for, like, you know, almost four pounds. But I guess they figured they were trying to cut into a new market, perhaps, with uh, with magazines like Mega Action. And uh, so they just priced them at 99p, which is, uh, which is pretty crazy. Uh, the cover story here is Populous 2. Which, you know, maybe you see that and, you know, that's not blowing your skirt up. But what's cool about that, at least to me, is that Populous 2 on the Mega Drive was a PAL exclusive. So uh, a very appropriate uh, game to have on the cover of this magazine that we're going to read. We also see here they're previewing uh, Thunderhawk CD, Street Fighter 2, Operation Starfish. Jungle Strike, which is a little bit uh, uh, messed up there on the cover. They review Splatterhouse 3, Summer Challenge, and MiG-29. And then down here you see uh, free Chuppa Chups. And it even says, uh, no Chuppa Chups, Lolly. Ask your news agent. And uh, what is a Chuppa Chup? We'll get into that uh, a little bit more uh, later. And then down here, a six-page uh, flashback guide. Flashback, of course, being the uh, CD game on a cartridge. Uh, as it was uh, advertised. So as we open the magazine up here, the first thing we've got is this ad, which uh, it says it's the Action Zone. And, uh, you know, for those of you in North America, like myself, you might not instantly recognize that these are phone numbers. Uh, they, you know, they format their phone numbers a little bit differently over there. But, uh, you know, these are all things where, you know, you can win the Super Nintendo here, or you can win a Game Gear or I guess win some Star Trek videos by calling these various numbers. And of course they're gonna charge you. It says down here in small print that it's uh, 36p during off-peak hours or 48p, uh, p, p being pence, uh, during uh, peak time. So I guess it's kind of similar to like the, the 976 numbers we had here or the 1900 numbers, although not those 1900 numbers. Uh, and yeah, oh, over here, look at that, there's a Amiga 600, that looks pretty awesome. But, uh, you know, I don't know if people actually even won these things or not, but but uh, but here it is. Then on the next page here, we have the table of contents, which uh, we won't go through in too much detail. Uh, down here, they, they talk about world news, and they're showing the then new Model 2 Mega Drive with the Model 2 Mega CD. And then down here, they're talking about their quote-unquote massive flashback player's guide, which was a little bit of a letdown, and I'll get to that. Uh, when we get there. And then one other thing I just wanted to point out that I just really appreciate it when game magazines do this is that they have a separate review index over here so that if you're just trying to jump straight to a review, it tells you exactly where it is. And that's helpful for, for me now as, you know, sort of a video game history aficionado 
Because if I'm looking through a bunch of magazines, looking through a review, I can just go straight to the table of contents and go, oh, it's, it's not there, move on to the next issue. But I think it was also uh, a nice touch to have uh, back in the day. Uh, now's the world news uh, section. And uh, this is just sort of like, you know, little news blurbs. And uh, over here, we've got uh, uh, a little blurb about Rocket Knight Adventures, which uh, was a pretty cool game from Konami. You don't really hear Rocket Knight Adventures talked about uh, that much, surprisingly, because it seems like, for the most part, if people play it, they end up walking away, you know, having a positive impression and, and really liking it. And, uh, you know, I know they're not developed by the same company, but if I had to think of one game that, for some reason, Rocket Knight Adventures reminds me of, it's uh, Gunstar Heroes. And uh, I, just something about the way it's a very fast-paced, uh, side-scrolling action game. Uh, what kind of animal is Rocket Knight? I'm not, uh, I'm not really 100% sure. Is he, a, is he like a possum or an armadillo? It doesn't seem to say there. But, uh, but anyway, definitely a cool game uh, worth checking out. And then uh, up here they've got Bob. And uh, I don't know how many of you have checked out Bob. That was an electronic arts release uh, on the Genesis and Mega Drive. Kind of a cool game. Again, it's a side-scrolling uh, sort of action platformer. And, uh, you know, Bob is like this teenage robot who, uh, it sets the whole story right at the beginning. It has like a little cutscene before the game starts. It's kind of funny. Bob's a teenager and he's trying to take some girl out on a date and he wants to borrow his dad's car. And, you know, his dad tells him something about how, you know, if you damage the car, I'm going to kill you. And so, of course, he takes the car out and immediately crashes it uh, in space, by the way. He's, he's driving the car in space. Uh, he crashes it and then ends up landing on this planet. And somehow he has a rifle with him. I don't really understand how that works. But, um, you know, it's not going to win any awards, uh, in my opinion. But, uh, but it's a pretty neat little game and, uh, and worth checking out. And then down here, they've got this little thing, Breaking the Mold. And it says, uh, Game Breaker is the latest and best computer entertainment video. A bi-monthly feature, Game Breaker Issue 1, features over 25 Sega and Nintendo games, including Alien 3, Street Fighter 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But so, basically what this was, uh, this was like, if you want to call it a video game magazine, uh, you can. But it was like a video magazine. It came on a VHS tape. And uh, you could buy it. It says here at video retailer. So I don't know if this was maybe not something that you could pick up at uh, at your local news agent. But uh, interestingly, uh, issue number one, if you want to call it that, I would call it episode one of Game Breaker was the only one that ever came out. And uh, a couple people have been nice enough to uh, digitize their copies of Game Breaker and put it up on YouTube so you can check it out. And it's kind of funny to watch now because like the... The narrator has like this, you know, monster truck style uh, of narration that if I try to do it right now, it's just going to irritate my throat. All right, let's go to places you never dreamed of. This is the ultimate game breaker. 100% unofficial and not approved by anyone except the best players in the world. It's the kind of thing that you watch now and it gets old real fast. And it just seems real cheesy, but I can guarantee you that if I had watched that when I was, you know, 15 years old, uh, back then I would have thought that uh, that it was pretty cool. And down here it says JVC beeps, uh, beefs up on CD. So they're talking about uh, just some of the titles that JVC was publishing on the uh, Mega CD and specifically talking about uh, Monkey Island, which uh, if you've never played one of the Monkey Island games... Uh, Secret of Monkey Island specifically here is the first uh, the first game in the series. Uh, there's some of the best adventure games, uh, LucasArts adventure games that you could ever want to play. And, um, you know, obviously if you play on a computer, you're going to play with a mouse. And uh, it's a little bit easier to play, I would say. But uh, perfectly playable uh, on, the, on the Mega CD. And, uh, and I enjoyed it. And then the other game they, they mention here is uh, Wonder Dog. Kind of an odd game, because Wonder Dog, at least to me, very much plays like a kid's game. And I don't know how many little kids had, you know, Mega Drives with Mega CDs. And on this side, we have uh, 
they talk about the uh, the mouse. I don't know, was it called a Mega Mouse? You would expect it to be called that. But uh, but the mouse for the Mega Drive anyway. And uh, I have one of those. I think the only game I have uh, to you know use with it is Art Alive. And uh, I'm not even sure that I've ever tried that. And then I don't know how many of you are familiar with this device. They came out in Japan with a karaoke add-on for uh, if you had a, a Mega Model 1 Mega Drive and Model 1 Mega CD, you could stick this karaoke uh, add-on on there that I guess just gave you microphone inputs. And uh, I don't know if that was somehow needed to like display lyrics on the screen. Uh, I mean, it should go without saying that I've, I've never gotten to personally use one of these things, nor would I probably want to. And uh, then down here, I already alluded to this earlier, but uh, they mentioned that the uh, the Model 2 Mega Drive and Model 2 Mega CD uh, are going to be coming out, which, you know, I'm sure it must have just been some kind of cost-saving measure, but I really never understood uh, why they did that. You know, like for me, the the form factor of the Model 1 Genesis was really one of the selling points for me. I thought it looked so cool. And uh, the Genesis 2 just looks kind of like, eh. So, you know, I don't know. I don't know why they felt the need to do that other than, like I said, maybe it was a cost-cutting measure. I don't know how much money you're saving doing that. And uh, down here, they just briefly mention uh, Pele. Uh, Pele Soccer was a Mega Drive and Genesis game that was published by Accolade and is okay. Oh, here you go. Here's another one of the magazines I, I mentioned. Uh, GB Action. Also, uh, 99p. So uh, that would be kind of cool to check out. And then continuing with the news, uh, two odd uh, peripherals for uh, for the Mega Drive here. Although, you know, you notice this is the U.S. update section. So maybe this is only things that came out uh, in the United States. They have the Activator, which, of course, you know, I remember seeing the commercials for the Activator or uh, seeing ads in magazines. Never seen one in person. It seems kind of stupid. Uh, so many commercials did a really good job of making peripherals like this seem really cool. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of things like uh, the Power Glove or the U-Force, uh, both for the NES. And then you'd actually get one and you'd realize that it really isn't anything great and that you're better off just using the standard controller. And uh, up here, the Virtua headset, uh, I don't know anything about that, but it, it probably falls under the same category. And then a couple of articles about uh, Star Wars games coming out. The first tier, Rebel Assault, is a mega CD game. And um, I don't know, I don't really think the game is that great. Uh, you know, I guess I expected something that was gonna be a little bit closer to like X-Wing on the PC. Not as good as X-Wing on the PC, that would be an unrealistic expectation, but uh, it's really just more of like an on-rail shooter. And uh, I didn't really enjoy it very much at all. Uh, and then down here, they mention uh, Star Wars from U.S. Gold, which uh, I never knew that that was at one point planned for a release on the Mega Drive and Genesis. This is the same Star Wars game that came out on, uh, on the NES. And on Sega consoles, it came out on the Game Gear and Master System, but it never did come out uh, on the 16-bit hardware. More interesting, I would say, is down here, this uh, this little blurb about the teleplay modem, or they call it the teleplay system. Uh, so this was this modem, I guess you'd call it a modem, that was uh, designed for both the Genesis and the NES. And it got so close to being released that A, this blurb says that it had been released in the US, and apparently like $300,000 worth of orders had been placed for this device. And then like at the last minute, it ended up not coming out. So, uh, you know, apparently it was going to basically let you play uh, two player games with people remotely, which would have been really cool. Uh, here they've got this Gallup chart. So, you know, we had like the charts in uh, in the U.S. gaming magazines as well. Sometimes it wasn't 100% clear to me how they came up with the numbers for those charts. But this being a Gallup chart at least makes me feel like it has some it has some sort of air of legitimacy to it. And these are always just kind of fun to look at just because they give you sort of a snapshot in time of uh, what the gaming landscape was was like 
in the late spring and early summer of 93 if you were a Mega Drive gamer in the UK. And I'm pretty surprised, I have to say, although uh, pleasantly so, that PGA Tour Golf 2 actually takes the top spot. Uh, I've talked about before the PGA Tour Golf series uh, on the Genesis and, uh, you know, the high esteem in which I hold it. But, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't be so surprised only because, of course, uh, golf was invented in uh, the British Isles. But uh, I'm still a little bit surprised that it would take the top spot, but that's cool. And then uh, number two, you've got Streets of Rage 2, which is, of course, uh, an awesome game, followed by Echo the Dolphin, Road Rash 2, and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Uh, Not so surprised to see Lemmings at number six, again, because we're looking at a UK magazine, followed by European Club Soccer. And, um, yeah, nothing else really sticks out to me too much. Me a Golden Axe 2, that's, of course, awesome. But, uh, but yeah, and then over here, I've just got uh, some more ads. And then we get into the previews. And uh, what a way to start the preview section, but with Jungle Strike. Uh, I'm a pretty big fan of the Strike series in general. Uh, you know, I've told the story before about, you know, getting Desert Strike for the Atari Lynx. But, uh, you know, you don't really hear people too much talking about the Strike series, I don't feel. And, uh, and it's too bad because they're really awesome games. Uh, Desert Strike, I remember renting for the Genesis back in the day. But uh, if you've never played Jungle Strike, it is definitely worth your time. This is the kind of game I could just spend an afternoon, like a Saturday afternoon, uh, just playing uh, for hours on end. You know, you start off uh, in, you know, the familiar helicopter, but pretty quickly you end up in a hovercraft. And uh, apparently at some point you fly a stealth fighter. I never got that far into the game, but uh, but that's pretty awesome. Uh, this is just a great, great game that uh, you should definitely check out. And I'm kind of surprised. I don't know if this is a typo or something. It says the price was going to be £23.99, which seems awfully cheap. Games would still be like £40 uh, in the UK, which you know translates to you know over $50 US. And, you know, a lot of Genesis games were over $50 here in the United States. So £23.99 just seems like suspiciously cheap. So I wonder if that's a typo. Next, more ads. And then over here, they've got uh, this page about a couple of games coming from Cygnosis. And, you know, it's funny because Cygnosis didn't really get on my radar uh, until I got a PlayStation in 1997. Uh, Cygnosis played a huge role in the early days of the PlayStation and uh, which is no surprise because by then Sony owned Cygnosis. Uh, they let them keep their name for a while and then they ended up becoming uh, like Sony Studio Liverpool or something like that. But uh, Cygnosis really made their bones uh, developing games for the Amiga. And then a lot of those Amiga games ended up coming out on the Mega Drive. And here you've got Wiz and Liz and uh, Pugsy. You know, Wiz and Liz was, you know, kind of an okay game. It definitely felt very much like an Amiga game. Uh, Not surprisingly, because that's where it got its start. And then Pugsy, I thought, was actually the more compelling of the two games. You know, it's a side-scrolling platformer, but there are all these items uh, in the level that you can sort of interact with or pick up and that you have to use uh, to progress through the level, like whether it's to help you reach up to a platform or to swing across a a large expanse or something. And uh, I thought it was a cool game. I didn't really understand at first, like what the heck is Pugsy? He looks like a deflated starfish or something, but apparently he's an alien. And then we move on to uh, Millennium. Millennium, once again, is a company that primarily developed Amiga games but uh, presumably because the Amiga and the Mega Drive share the same processor, the Motorola 68000, that must make it easy to port games over because a lot of games on the Mega Drive and Genesis were originally Amiga games. And uh, the first one they have here is Beast Ball. And Beast Ball did not end up coming out uh, on the Mega Drive or Genesis. It uh, it did come out on the Amiga. I'm not sure that was the name. I feel like it came out under a different name. Uh, you can actually find uh, a ROM, uh, like a prototype ROM of Beast Ball, like if you want to check it out for yourself. It was basically finished and then uh, and then never released. 
And then down here they have Operation Starfish. And um, this was the third game in the James Pond series. And I guess Operation Starfish was like the subtitle or something. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if you like the James Pond games, I mean, I think they're pretty cool for what they are. You know, for some reason, it just seems like platform games were a lot more popular in the UK than they were here. And you might be thinking like, well, wait a minute. I mean, Super Mario Brothers is like the most popular game ever. And that's a platform game. And that's very true. But I think that there were a lot of other platform games that came out here that were not nearly as popular. And once you take Super Mario Brothers sort of out of the equation, a lot of the other most popular games we had here were not platform games. And what you're going to see as we go through this magazine is you're going to see a lot of platform games. You know, I wonder how much of that may have to do with the more stringent uh, video game censorship that they had uh, in the UK. Obviously, platform games uh, are generally a lot more family friendly. But uh, anyway, to get back to Operation Starfish, you know, I thought it was a fun game. Uh, I probably wouldn't have wanted to drop 50 bucks on it back in the day. Perfectly reasonable game to rent for a weekend. Uh, apparently, this third installment in the series was supposed to have more of the feeling of Super Mario World. And I don't really know if I got that from it necessarily, but, uh, but I had fun with it. And then over here is an ad. It's funny, you know, in the U.S. magazines, I feel like you saw these ads more in like the back of the magazine and sort of in the meaty part uh, of the magazine, you would just see like ads from game companies. But we're not really seeing that so much uh, here. And so I don't know if that maybe they felt more like there was a conflict of interest, which there kind of is, uh, having uh, game companies advertising their games in the magazines. I don't really know. Uh, next here we have Street Fighter II Championship Edition, which, uh, you know, at least the arcade version, uh, Street Fighter II Champion Edition, is my personal favorite uh, iteration, if you will, of, uh, of Street Fighter II. I know that the Genesis and Mega Drive version of the game is not the most uh, well-regarded amongst uh, Street Fighter aficionados, but uh, but I really like it. You know, I understand the graphics are not quite as good. But, you know, people always compare it to uh, Street Fighter II on the Super Nintendo, which, you know, if you want to point to any one thing and say that that was like a watershed moment for a console, it, it has to be... Nintendo locking up the exclusivity rights to uh, Street Fighter 2 in uh, in 1992. So, you know, this was the first edition of Street Fighter 2 to make an appearance on Sega's home hardware. You know, I, again, I know, you know, people compare it to the Super Nintendo version and say, well, the colors aren't as good or the speech samples aren't as good. But at least for me, like the thing that made this game great to play was the official Sega six button controller which uh, I still think to this day is the perfect controller for, for playing really any fighting game. Uh, they also have here this Hori Mega Commander, which, I mean, looks cool enough, but you can see it has more of a Nintendo-style D-pad on it. You know, they make a big deal about the fact that, oh, there's a six-button controller, but, you know, to be fair, the Super Nintendo just had a six-button controller uh, right from the start. So, you know, it's unfortunate that the Genesis had to do something like that, but... Uh, I feel like they took advantage of the opportunity to make what is, in my opinion, one of the best controllers uh, ever made. You know, I, I don't have the expectation, I guess, that the home version should be as good as the arcade. I, I do have the arcade board, and so obviously that's the best way to play it. But, you know, I never played this game back in the day and felt like, oh, it's good, but it's not as good as the arcade. Because, like, you know, that was a given going in. And very few of us back then had the luxury of having both 16-bit home consoles. And so it was really more of a situation of like, well, I have a Genesis, so great, now I can play Street Fighter 2. Uh, and here we get to Populous 2. Again, uh, this was the cover story. Uh, I talked about the original Populous on the Genesis in my Sega Genesis in 1990 episode. Uh, that was one of the first games to come out uh, for Sega 16-bit hardware from EA. And, uh, you know, I think I only mentioned the game briefly uh, at, you know, at some point in the video, uh, just because I didn't know that much about it. And I didn't really feel like it was a game I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about. And um, I can only guess that perhaps the game didn't sell well because the original Populous was uh, published by uh, by EA. 
But uh, Populous 2 here was published by Virgin, which is probably why it only came out uh, in the UK. The game takes place, uh, the original Populous, the, the game takes place in, like, I guess you'd call it medieval times. And uh, Populous 2, which for some reason on uh, the Mega Drive is called Populous 2, Two Tribes. And uh, I can't remember what it was called on home computers, like the Gods of Olympus or something like that. Uh, but this takes place in, like, ancient Greece. So apparently they, they cleaned up the interface a little bit, uh, to, you know, to make it, I guess, look a little bit better, maybe function a little bit better. But again, they, they sort of changed the atmosphere of the game by, uh, by having it take place in, uh, in ancient Greece instead of medieval times. Uh, I've just personally never really gotten the Populous games. I mean, Populous is heralded by some as, you know, one of the greatest video games of all time. And maybe I just sort of don't feel equipped to have a strong opinion about it. Because I've tried playing the game and I just feel like there must be more to it that, uh, that I'm not getting. Uh, you know, basically you, you play like a god and you have these people, you know, on the land and, you know, you can raise and lower the land, sort of like terraform it to help your people, you know, expand and thrive. And then on the same map will be, you know, another group of people being controlled by the computer god. And basically at some point you send your people out to go like commit genocide on the other group of people. And, um, I don't know, to me, it just feels like you're playing like the SimCity terrain editor and and sort of letting the city build itself. But but like I said, I, I think there just must be more to the game that uh, that I just don't realize. But like I said, I just think it's cool that the cover story of this magazine uh, was a game or is a game that was a UK exclusive because I feel like that's, you know, pretty appropriate. And, you know, something I sort of mentioned in the Super Nintendo in 1991 video when I was talking about SimCity, you know, the Mega Drive is certainly not the uh, best venue, if you will, to experience a populist game. But if you were somebody who was not fortunate enough to have a home computer back then, because of course back then, home computers were more of a luxury item and not the ubiquitous home appliance that they are now, this allowed you to still play a game like that. And, and that's pretty cool. Uh, next, we just have a bunch of more ads. Uh, and then we get into another preview coming soon from Accolade. And I've talked about before, Accolade is sort of one of my my favorite uh, uh, developers and publishers uh, on the Genesis and Mega Drive. And they've got three games here. The first is Jack Nicholas Power Challenge Golf, which I had never played before. But, uh, you know, I checked it out and I have to say that I was actually impressed. Uh, I had a good time playing it. It's still not as good as PGA Tour Golf 2. They, they even say here, can Jack Nicholas knock PGA Tour Golf 2 off its perch and come out on par? Uh, I wouldn't say that. If you, if you want to play the best game, uh, golf game, on Sega 16-bit hardware, it's got to be PGA Tour Golf uh, 2 or 3 or European Tour. But this is still a very decent game, and I had fun playing it. And then over here we have Bubsy Bobcat, which uh, was just released as Bubsy. I don't know if its official title is Bubsy the Bobcat. But um, I feel like Bubsy kind of gets a bad rap because Bubsy 3D on, uh, on the PlayStation was such a horrible game. But uh, at least in my opinion, this 2D Bubsy, uh, again, here we go, uh, another platform game, I thought was a perfectly decent game. I, I had fun playing it. Again, it's not a game that I would have wanted to own back in the day, but it would have been fine uh, just to rent. And then uh, over here they have Summer Challenge, which uh, I think Summer Challenge, if I'm not mistaken, actually gets reviewed later in this issue, which is kind of weird that they have a preview and a review of it, but that's okay. So we'll wait and talk about that later. And then uh, for anybody that watched the last episode, the Mega Drive fan episode, uh, we talked about the Sega Terra Drive which was like the combination uh, 286 IBM PC clone that had the Mega Drive built into it. And I didn't know this, that apparently they had something very similar in, uh, in the UK. This Silica Systems company uh, is, is advertising a few different uh, computer systems here. But it even says here, with free built-in Sega Mega Drive, uh, well, it says compatible game console. So... But there's no way that could have been emulation, I don't think, back then. So I, 
I'm assuming they had a Motorola 68000 in there as like some kind of secondary processor. I really have no idea how, how these things worked. But, um, but if you'll remember, that Sega Terra drive was a 286. And I mentioned that I thought that was kind of bizarre because by, uh, by that time, a 286... What, and this was a 1991 magazine, but even by then, a 286 was getting pretty long in the tooth, and there were going to be games coming out that you wouldn't be able to play. But you see here, you're getting a 386 for uh, 699 pounds, or a 486 for 899 pounds, and those come with a VGA color monitor, so uh, so that's not bad. Although they even tell you down here, well, you get a VGA monitor, uh, you can have a 40 meg hard drive or 130, uh, one, two, or tor four megs of RAM, et cetera, et cetera. So you can only imagine that, you know, you would call this phone number and try to order one of these systems. And I'm sure the representative on the phone was just trying to upsell you like crazy. Now we get into the review section. And uh, I guess they're trying to sort of introduce themselves here. What a mega welcome. And they talk about uh, the team of, of reviewers here. And here they're just showing this is sort of the format. Uh, of the reviews, you can see they have four categories they look at. Sound, graphics, addictiveness, and playability, and then they give it an overall score. And, uh, and then these are the five reviewers here. And, you know, whenever I see these things, I always just kind of wonder for some reason, like, you know, whatever happened to these guys, you know, because, you know, they're all ostensibly in their early 20s. And so, I mean, really, when I was in my early 20s, you know, be working for a video game magazine, writing reviews would have been like my dream job. Like this guy, apparently, this guy was doing duck face way before duck face uh, was popular. Anyway, uh, the first, you know, again, with the with the platform games, the very first review here is uh, is Tiny Toons, which and I think this, there were two Tiny Toons games uh, on the 16 bit uh, Genesis or uh, 16 bit Sega hardware, rather. And uh, this was the first one. I, I think this is called uh, Buster's Hidden Treasure. But, uh, you know, it's funny, I, I saw this and, and my first reaction was just like, oh, God, I got to play a Tiny Toons game now. And it, it's so funny because, like, you know, you see here it's a Konami game. Like, I should have known that it was going to be a decent game. Like, for whatever reason, I'm like, all right, let me play this game. And I fired it up and, like, instantly I was like, oh, like, this game is actually pretty cool. And, um, you know, for as long as I played it, you know, just checking it out and recording gameplay footage, I really enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. The graphics are great, and they have that cartoony look, uh, as you would expect. But the game also just controls really well. Now, for me, I was really never into the Tiny Toons. Uh, when I was a kid, my best friend watched the show religiously, and I went over to his house literally every day after school. And so, like, he'd be watching Tiny Toons, and I don't maybe I wasn't really paying attention because I don't, I don't remember the the show that much. But uh, but it was a very popular show, and it's just kind of nice to see. Uh, maybe not for once, but it was certainly a rare occurrence for, you know, uh, a video game based on a TV license or movie license to end up actually being good. You know, another example being like the Batman games for the NES and Game Boy and Genesis, also uh, excellent games. But uh, yeah, they give it a 90% and uh, it gets their gold award. So uh, they obviously thought it was really good. Uh, oh, well, speak of the devil here. Uh, so next we have uh, Batman Revenge of the Joker. And oh, one thing I should point out, I guess, about the reviews, uh, you see here, uh, so official here means that it, they were playing like an official PAL release. And then if it says import as an American flag, obviously that means they're playing an American import. That doesn't necessarily mean that a game did or didn't get a PAL release. But perhaps, you know, it was very uh, common back then that... Games would come out first in Japan, naturally, and then they would come out in North America, you know, sometime later, and then sometime later after that, they would finally come out in the UK. So I think just there were certain instances here where, the and I'm not saying specifically that was necessarily the case with Batman Revenge of the Joker here, but I think sometimes they would get their hands on American import games and they would go ahead and review them. But uh, again, that just... That shouldn't be taken to mean that the game was never released uh, in PAL territories. Now, uh, this is a Sunsoft game. I just want to point that out quickly. Uh, because as I just got done saying, the, the Sunsoft Batman games on the NES Game Boy and Genesis 
are, at least in my opinion, great games. And all three of them are different games. They're not like ports or translation uh, translations of each other. So just because you've played one, you know, each of the other two is going to be a totally different experience. And they're all really good games, which only makes me not understand what happened with uh, Batman Revenge of the Joker, which is really just an awful, in my opinion, awful, awful game. And for sure, if you read their review, they really don't have anything positive uh, to say about it. Uh, Even here uh, under tip, the only tip that can be given for this awful game is don't buy it. No, seriously, you'd be a lot better off using the explosive crossbow. What does that mean? Like shooting the game with a crossbow? I don't know what that means. But but then if you go down here and uh, and read, you know, this is just sort of a pre which is funny because, like, the review is not that long anyway. But but uh, this guy, um, who is this guy? Does anybody care? Uh, this guy, uh, Brad Burton, says, Holy rush job. It's not big, and it's certainly not clever. It's the same old story. A good license equals a crap game. It's a travesty when you think of what could have been. The Mega Drive really doesn't need a game like this. All it succeeds in doing is giving SNES owners something to laugh at, because, of course, this was the middle of the console wars. Sad graphics, poor sound, bad animation ensures that this game is really awful. I'd have to be a real joker if I recommend this binary fart. I don't know what a binary fart is, but the point is they're really, uh, you know, giving the game a bad review. But then they give it a 68%, which I don't really understand. Like a 68 really, you know, between 0 and 100, 68 shouldn't be that bad. But, you know, it's one of those things where I think, you know, we saw this time and time again, and really we still do, where uh, these magazines don't, they seem to be hesitant to give uh, a game too bad of a score. And I only point that out because later you'll see games that were actually pretty decent game, uh, games get scores in like the low 70s. And like you, you would wonder like, well, how is that score so close to a game that is so god awful? Uh, anyway, over here uh, is an ad for the QJ Top Fighter, the first truly programmable joystick. And, uh, you know, obviously I've never seen one of these joysticks, but I have to say that uh, it looks pretty cool anyway. Uh, Next review here we have is uh, Splatterhouse 3. And this is kind of interesting, uh, just right off the bat, I'll point out that according to them, this was an official PAL release game, except that at least that I can find, uh, this game was never released in the PAL region. But, you know, I don't know if maybe they were told the game was going to be imminently released uh, on PAL hardware, and so they went ahead and put that there, or maybe it's just a mistake, who knows. But, uh, you know, I'm really not surprised at all that this game did not come out in the UK uh, because it's, you know, at least of the games that I've played uh, on the Genesis and Mega Drive, it's got to be like the bloodiest, goriest, grossest game uh, on the system, which, you know, for me is uh, is awesome. Like, I think Splatterhouse 3 is great. It's easily the the best game in the series, uh, I would say. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, sort of considering the the sensibilities, if you will, uh, of the UK when it came to violent video games, I, it's really no surprise that, uh, that this didn't come out there. The cool thing about Splatterhouse 3, uh, in my opinion, is that it plays a lot more like what I consider a traditional beat-em-up game to be. So the first Splatterhouse on, well, in the arcade, obviously, but then also on the TurboGrafx-16, and then Splatterhouse 2, which was released uh, on uh, Sega, uh, the Genesis and Mega Drive, they were both like side-scrolling only. So, you know, something playing like something like Kung Fu Master or something. Whereas for me, a beat-em-up game, you should have some in-and-out movement, like, like Renegade did, or, you know, Final Fight, Streets of Rage, uh, Golden Axe, etc., etc. And with Splatterhouse 3, they finally added that, so that now you could move... Uh, you know, more in like three dimensions uh, around the the space that you were fighting in. But the other cool thing about Splatterhouse 3 is that it had like branching, even saying branching paths is kind of not giving it credit. Like you'd be in a room in the mansion and oftentimes two or maybe even three doors would open after you'd kill all the enemies. And then it was up to you to kind of go whichever direction you wanted to go in. And uh, I thought that made it pretty cool. 
But I mean, the graphics in uh, Splatter House 3 are also just awesome. The level of detail, uh, even in the background, if you see like right here in this screenshot, the detail in the background, but just the detail some of the bosses had, uh, it's just a really cool game. And then here we've got this review was written by this guy, Brad, again. And uh, he says down here, uh, if you're a lover of horror movies and beat-em-ups, this game will be up your street. I guess they said up your street instead of up your alley. But be warned, it's a nightmare come true, literally. This is definitely not a buy for those who dislike the growing trend for excessive violence and gore in computer games. Surely this game could have got by without resorting to such levels of graphic violence. I mean, if you said something like that in the early 90s around here, uh, that wouldn't go over well. You know, here in America, we loved our violent video games, especially when we were kids. And uh, I mean, I think for a lot of us, that's like the selling point of the Splatterhouse games. It's this over the top blood and gore to the point of it being comical. But, uh, you know, they had different sensibilities over there in the UK. And uh, and so there you go. Uh, did anybody here want to win a dream holiday anywhere in the world? Uh, this was apparently being put on by Europress, and uh, all you had to do was subscribe to one of their magazines and fill this up and hand it to your news agent, and, uh, and you could win a dream vacation wherever you want. How exciting is that? Uh, next is a review of Sunset Riders. Uh, Sunset Riders was, of course, a Konami arcade game, apparently released on the same hardware as the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, I believe. And, you know... Sunset Riders is a very well-regarded game uh, on the Genesis and Mega Drive. I want to say it also came out on the Super Nintendo, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, it's sort of a, it's like a side-scrolling, I guess you'd call it like a run-and-gun game. I mean, in, in some ways, the most direct comparison maybe that you could make would be with a game like Contra, if Contra was more sort of arcadey. And, I don't know, for me personally, I've just never... I've never been in, been able to get into Sunset Riders. Like, I, it's okay. Uh, I don't think it's that great. It's it's really hard. Um, in a way, like you know, people say like Contra is hard, but Contra is not really hard. It just it just takes practice. But Sunset Riders, I don't. I just can't get into it. The ambiance is very cool. Like you know, I love Gunsmoke, uh, Capcom arcade game that of course came out on the NES. Like I love that game. So, you know, the ambiance, the, the setting of Sunset Riders is pretty cool. But as far as the actual gameplay goes, uh, I could really take it or leave it. They give it an 82%, which I don't know if a 68% is zero, then I don't know. Is an 82% really all that great? Um, this guy even mentions the first thing you'll notice about Sunset Riders is how incredibly hard it is, which, uh, which is true. Uh, graphically, it's not the most inspiring game ever, but it does have a strange addictiveness that keeps you coming back for just one more game. Well, not me, but um, when he says the price is a little too steep for my liking uh, because it's a, a, well, basically 40 pounds game. So I, I guess maybe that was a premium price uh, over there in the UK. And then uh, over here is an ad for uh, this game Super Kickoff for the Mega Drive. And it says here on the cover, Europe's number one soccer game. And I saw that and I was like, how is that Europe's number one soccer game? Because, you know, of course, Sensible Soccer is Europe's number one soccer game. But um, the first Sensible Soccer didn't come out until sometime in the early 90s. I'm not, I want to say 92, but I think maybe it was even later than that, like 94. But then it, it, you notice in smaller print, it actually says Europe's number one soccer game with battery backup. So is that, are they trying to kind of get around, like, there is there some other soccer game that just doesn't happen to have battery backup that's actually more popular? I don't know. Um, I found this game to be quite unplayable, personally. Um, like, when you play the game, when you play a soccer game, it, you take this for granted, but it's like the ball kind of, like, sticks to your feet. Like, if you're running up the field, like, dribbling the ball, and you turn, like, the ball will kind of come with you. But uh, in this game, it doesn't do that. If you're dribbling the ball up the field and you turn, the ball keeps going straight, which, to be fair, is far more realistic. But uh, I found the, the game harder to play because that's apparently, like, you're supposed to, like, stop the ball with your foot and then turn, which, again, would be more realistic, I suppose. But, uh, you know, realism doesn't always make for the most fun in video games. Oh, yeah, so we were going to talk about uh, Chuppa Chups. 
So yeah, I mean, as it's, as you see here, Chupa Chups are like lollipops. Apparently they're the world's best selling lollipops. Uh, I've never seen them for sale here in, uh, in North America here. Of course we have Dum Dums and, uh, or, you know, you can get like Tootsie Pops or Blow Pops, but I think Chupa Chups don't have anything inside of them like Dum Dums don't. And then on the other side of the page here, you've got a review for Battletoads. And, you know, I feel like the NES version of Battletoads is sort of the most well-known version, which is a shame because I don't think very highly of, uh, of Battletoads on the NES. But playing this Mega Drive version, or I guess Genesis version, because it says import here, uh, I thought the game was quite a bit better and quite a bit more playable. I still would not count myself uh, as, as some kind of huge Battletoads fan, but, uh, but the game's definitely not bad. Uh, they give it an 87%, and uh, once again, uh, it gets the Silver Award. Oh, maybe I should mention here, this was a rare game. So it was a UK-developed uh, game. So I, there's, it seems like there's no way this game did not come out in, uh, in the UK, although I don't know that for a fact. Here's, an, here's a review for Flintstones. Uh, once again, uh, U.S. import, and uh, I, before reading this magazine, honestly, I didn't realize that there had been a Flintstones game uh, released on the Genesis, and, uh, you know, once again, we have a family-friendly uh, platform game, and, you know, the game's not great, but uh, I was sort of pleasantly surprised, because I definitely wasn't expecting much out of it. Kind of like Tiny Toons, the game's got the really cool you know, cartoony graphics that I think, uh, you know, the, the Mega Drive has the, the, the color palette and uh, the power to sort of make look a lot better than it could on, say, the NES. But, um, but it's really not a bad game at all. I think the only thing I found frustrating is that Fred's Club seems like it's really short. So, like, you really have to get, like, right up in the enemy's faces to, uh, to club them. And when you get that close, uh, oftentimes you're close enough that uh, that you take damage, but uh, but I thought it was a cool game. If you're looking for a platform game to play, maybe with your kids especially, uh, Flintstones is worth checking out. And then down here, so this is kind of like what I'm talking about with these review scores. So down here is this game, uh, Humans. So this was a game that for sure was only released in the United States. And it was funny, I was playing this game, uh, you know, I recorded the gameplay footage, and I was like, man, I know I've played this game before, but, uh, but I know I'd never played it on the Genesis before. And finally, what I realized is that I had played this game on the Atari Jaguar, where it was released as Evolution Dino Dudes. And uh, they compare the game here to Lemmings, which, um, yeah, I guess, you know, basically you, you start each level and you have a certain number of these little dudes and you can individually control each guy and you're basically moving them all around to sort of help each other out to get one of them to some sort of objective, whether that's just to reach the end of a level or to grab some object uh, or whatever. So it's really more of like a, a it's more of a puzzle game than uh, than anything else. But but I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, it's not great, but I mean, you know, they talk about the graphics aren't that great, but I thought the graphics were were perfectly fine. And um, I just thought it was a pretty fun game. And they give it only a 71%, which, like, I think that's a fair score, 71%. But then how can you say that uh, that Batman game was only 68% when it should have been, like, you know, 40 or something? And then, kind of surprised at the price, they say that the price was uh, £49.99, which I guess makes sense if you had to import it. That's the way it was here, right? If you wanted to import uh, a Japanese game, you were going to pay a premium, like 80 bucks or something. So maybe that's what was going on there. And then on the other side of the page here is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hyperstone Heist, or as you see here, TMHT. Uh, I can't imagine that many people don't know this by now, but if you didn't know this, in the UK, they weren't the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. They were the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles because you weren't allowed to have like ninjas as part of like children's programming. I don't know, I don't know how they came up with that, but... Uh, uh, I guess what they do is not important. It's just don't call them ninjas. So over there, it's TMHT instead of TMNT. And uh, something else that I learned, uh, you know, when I was reading about, you know, because I was kind of curious to kind of dig in a little bit deeper about like, well, why is it TMHT instead of TMNT? 
is that apparently in the UK, it was not legal to show nunchucks on TV. So, uh, and somebody put up, I think it was on YouTube, they put up side by side, like here is the introduction to the American cartoon and the introduction to the UK cartoon. Because they're the same cartoon, they have the same, uh, uh, you know, intro music and everything, except they're the hero turtles, not the Ninja Turtles. And any scene in the intro that showed Michelangelo using nunchucks was edited out to show something else instead. I didn't watch any full episodes, but I'm assuming it was the same thing that you couldn't show nunchucks, which just, it seems weird. Like, oh, Leonardo's got a gigantic sword. Uh, that's cool. Just don't show the nunchucks. I, I think that's a little bit strange, but whatever. So this is kind of like what, if you were a, a Genesis or Mega Drive owner, this is what you got instead of Turtles in Time, which is what... Uh, Super Nintendo uh, owners got. Uh, of course, Turtles in Time was an arcade game first and uh, and then was ported to the Super Nintendo. And, you know, I, this is another game where, you know, a lot of people really like these uh, Ninja Turtles beat up games and I'm just not that into it. Uh, I think they're a little bit boring. You know, you're really just fighting the same enemies over and over again. You're fighting the Foot Clan, which you know, I understand it's like following the TV show, right? I mean, the turtles were always fighting the Foot Clan soldiers or those little robot guys, I forgot what they're called. And, you know, the game even makes uh, the effort to at least have like different Foot Clan guys. Like there's not just the purple guys, there's like red guys and they have different weapons. But, you know, it's like you start off the game and you're in the sewers, if I remember correctly, you know, and then you end up going up to the street, you know, in the next level. And then the next level, you're back down in the sewers again. And it just like, I don't know. It, it just, you know, the the environments you're in are just like boring and repetitive. The enemies are boring and repetitive. Uh, I just don't really think that it's that great. And if you read the review, they they kind of actually agree with that. Uh, Hyperstone Heist is probably the best of the Turtles games so far, but still doesn't do the Turtle World justice. The graphics are fairly impressive, but the levels are so easy that with two players, you're guaranteed to breeze through quickly. There's lots of potential here, but unfortunately, it's been used very sparingly. And they give the game only a 78%, which um, a lot of people out there, I'm sure, would uh, would think that that's low. But um, but uh, I agree. And I just noticed up here, it says Shredder's back, and he's just shrunk Manhattan, and they misspelled Manhattan. More reviews here. Uh, first is Hardball 3, which I guess I'm kind of surprised Hardball 3 got uh, an official... PAL release, uh, just because I didn't think baseball would be very popular over there. And, um, you know, I've said before that I think that there's, you know, there was kind of a shortage, in my opinion, of good baseball games on um, on the 16-bit home hardware. But I, I reviewed the original hardball for, uh, for my website, like, years and years ago. And, and I think I said something to the effect of, you know, it's not the best baseball game out there, but if it was the only one that I had, you know, I'd be, it, it was like good enough. But um, Hardball 3 is uh, not as good, sadly, as the original Hardball. They, they tried to get a little bit fancier with it. Like uh, you have a behind the batter view if you're batting and then, you know, which is kind of like most, most baseball games. But then if you were pitching, then you had a behind the pitcher view like bases loaded. And that was kind of cool, you know, to try to make it seem a little bit more like broadcasty, but uh, but the game just doesn't really play that well. I'm kind of surprised. Well, I'm actually really surprised that it gets an 89% and the silver award, uh, because like I would much rather play like Tommy Lasorda baseball or uh, sports talk baseball, both of which were were out uh, already by 1993. Tommy Lasorda, of course, being a launch game. And some people don't realize that uh, uh, Sports Talk Baseball was actually the sequel to Tommy Lasorda Baseball. And uh, that came out in, I want to say, 1991. Then uh, over here is in, uh, a review for Slime World. So see, they, they are perfectly capable of giving a game an actually low score, 48%. And, you know, Todd's Adventures in Slime World on the Genesis is really not that great of a game. But reading this review, I kind of couldn't help but feel like maybe they didn't play it that much or didn't really understand its provenance. Todd's Adventures in Slime World was originally developed for the Atari Lynx and on that system is is a really good game and it was subsequently ported to the Genesis and somehow it it 
manages to not look as good on the Genesis, but also not play as well. But like they don't explain in here anything. They don't even mention that it was on the links, which makes me think they just didn't know. But they don't even talk about like the different game modes that uh, the game has. Somewhere in here, they refer to Todd's weapon as a, oh yeah, yeah. Taking the role of Todd with the help of your low powered laser gun. It's not a laser gun, it's a water gun. And that might just seem like a, you know, well, who cares? But it just makes me think like, did you really understand the game? Like it's a water gun, because he's using water to fight the slime creatures then he gets in like the pools of water and wipes the slime, washes the slime off of his body. I don't know, just reading that review just made me think like you really didn't, that game kind of went over your head a little bit. And uh, down here is a review for Cheeky Cheeky Boys, which I know I've talked about Cheeky Cheeky Boys before uh, on the show. Kind of a, a lesser known, I would say, uh, a Genesis and Mega Drive game, but really good game. Uh, this was a Capcom CPS game in the arcades and was released here in North America as Mega Twins. And uh, in Japan, I guess it was called, uh, called Cheeky Cheeky Boys. And, uh, and they released it on, uh, on the Genesis. I don't know if this game came out in the UK or not. He says import here, so I don't know if it subsequently got a PAL release or not. But, um, but they stuck with the original Cheeky Cheeky Boys name. And, you know, it's a side-scrolling, you know, action platform game again. But uh, it's just a pretty good one, uh, in my opinion. It's got really nice graphics. The game controls really well. So, you know, they give it an 85, and I think that uh, that's a score that's well-deserved. Oh, yeah, so I mentioned that, you know, they did the preview of Summer Challenge, but that I thought that it was reviewed later, and uh, and sure enough, it was. So this is just another one of these, uh, you know, Summer Olympic-type uh, games, like, uh, well, there was a Summer Games, right? Uh, Summer Games game that came out. And this is an accolade game. And, um, you know, I think it kind of, you know, falls into the same uh, trap as a lot of these games, where, you know, it's really like a bunch of different games in one. And some of those games turn out well, and other games, uh, not so much. And uh, so like they're showing up here, uh, Archery. I thought the Archery was pretty fun uh, in this game. Here they're showing that, you know, you're jumping over these hurdles. And I have to give them credit for the attempt that uh, when you're playing uh, this particular event, uh, the, the hurdles, it's, it's in like 3D, like it's a third person perspective, like you're behind the runner. And I mean, it looks pretty impressive. Uh, the problem is, is it makes it really hard to play because uh, your runner is kind of blocking your view a little bit uh, of the hurdles. And then I don't know if it's like an input lag kind of thing or something, but it's like you have to push the jump button like way before you actually want your runner to jump. So that would be an example of an event that is not very good. Uh, over here, they've got the, the javelin throw. That one was really fun. Uh, but then up here is cycling, which was also really boring. And uh, if you re read the review or just read the Prey C down here, that's basically what uh, the reviewer is saying. He says, yikes, there's more rough than smooth with Summer Challenge, which I agree with. However, it would be unfair for me to slag the whole game off because some parts aren't all that bad. It's an un unoriginal game with a novel approach. I don't think it's fair to call it unoriginal. I mean, how can you make an Olympic game and make it be original? Uh, some of it's a good laugh, but is it worth spending... 40 pounds for a giggle, probably not. And uh, I would agree with that. Uh, I guess now we're done with the reviews. Uh, we get into mega tips. Uh, so they just have tips for uh, various games. Uh, nothing here that I think is really all that interesting uh, to talk about. Uh, they have dial a tip over here. Wow. How much is that? Oh, it's still. I wonder if 36p slash 48p was some sort of industry standard rate. Like maybe the government. Uh, dictated that because I noticed that's the same price that everything's charging in here. And then down here they have uh, some codes for both the uh, Pro Action Replay and the Game Genie. And then next we get into this flashback uh, uh, guide, which they call the complete solution. You know, flashback was uh, was advertised as uh, you know a CD game on a cartridge, and I think that was really because it had like these little cutscenes or little animations which I'm sure now to anybody look very unimpressive, but uh, I can tell you for sure that back then, uh, we thought that stuff looked really cool. Uh, you know, if you've ever seen the, the 
music video for Money for Nothing by Dire Straits, same thing, or uh, the Kraftwerk uh, video for uh, Music Nonstop. It was that same kind of like very simple flat shaded polygons. But uh, at the time, that looked like very advanced. And so the fact that this game had that uh, made it look pretty cool. You know, I really haven't spent that much time playing Flashback. Uh, my main memory of Flashback is I did actually rent this game, you know, sometime right after it came out. So, you know, uh, ostensibly in like 1993. And uh, it was an example of, you know, it was very common back then that you would rent a game and you wouldn't get any kind of manual with it or anything. Like sometimes you would get like a one page manual or you would get those like pre-made, pre-printed game cases that had like some basic controls written on them. But uh, sometimes you would just get nothing. And uh, I just remember getting flashback and getting home and popping it into my Genesis and just being kind of lost. Like I don't understand what it is that I'm supposed to do. And uh, I think it's kind of too bad because I think that Flashback is actually a pretty decent game. And, uh, you know, I can't really say that I didn't give it a chance. It was just like I don't think I had a chance to give it a chance. This was, of course, before the Internet was the Internet as we know it. So I couldn't just like fire up AOL and uh, find some tips online. But um, so like I've never personally, I've never played the game past the first level. So like what you're seeing here is all I've ever seen uh, of the game. But uh, it's just funny that they say complete solution over here. It's the complete solution. And so you might see this and go, oh, cool. All right, I'm going to, in fact, I did. I was reading this and I was like, you know what? I should sit down and I'll just use this and I'll, I'll play through the entire game. And that way I will have seen it. Because, uh, you know, here's showing these other levels and like, you know, it's not, you're not just in this weird jungle uh, environment the whole time. You, there's all these other cool places you get to go. And I thought, well, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to check this out. And then you get to the end of, of the sixth page and it's like, uh, next issue part two. So it's like, that's not the complete solution then. Like that's kind of false advertising, but, uh, but whatever. Uh, next, uh, the core of mega CD. So what this is, is, uh, an article about the video game company, the, the developer core. And, uh, they're specifically talking here about the fact that core was developing games, for uh, for the Mega CD, but uh, just to give you a few examples of games that Core is known for, uh, like the Chuck Rock uh, series comes to mind. Uh, what else do they have here? Oh, Corporation. You remember we talked about Corporation uh, one time on the Genesis, if I remember correctly. And I mean, clearly Core is most famous for uh, Tomb Raider, but you know that was not going to be for a couple more years. Uh, after uh, after this came out, and uh, oh, uh, Jaguar XJ220 that was also a, a Mega CD game, and what they're talking about here though is uh, Thunderhawk CD, and I don't know where that was released as Thunderhawk CD, but uh, here in North America at least the game was released as AH3 Thunderstrike, and you know it's one of these uh, first person helicopter shooters. But I got to be honest and say that if you check it out, uh, it's actually a pretty decent game. Like, I was impressed uh, with it. Like, I didn't expect much when I fired it up. But, you know, I thought, like, hey, this is actually a pretty decent game. And then um, down here they talk about, uh, the, you know, it says the future of CD. And they talk about Bubba and Sticks, which I don't remember Bubba and Sticks ever coming out on CD. That was a cartridge game. But uh, that's also a pretty interesting uh, platform game. And then uh, Chuck Rock 2, Son of Chuck Rock. That one, I want to say, came out on cartridge and CD. Uh, here, oh, more Chuppa Chups. So here you could win uh, some Chuppa Chups lollies. And uh, they don't say how many lollipops. Maybe you just get one of these store displays. That would already be cool. And, uh, and then I guess you win a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of games too. So, oh, you win a, a you win a mega CD. So that would be kind of cool. Uh, and then you can phone it in. But once again, thirty six p per minute off peak and forty eight p at all other times. Uh, reader survey, and then you could win uh, a free game. They don't really talk about um, how many people were going to win a free game, but you know it's just a survey about like what kind of games do you like? How did you hear about Mega Action, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Uh, oh, yeah, this was something I wanted to talk about. So Mega Library here. Uh, this well, I'll just read it to you right here. If you are confused by the vast amount of Mega Drive games available and find choosing a game almost impossible, look no further. We have compiled the most definitive guide to all the best Mega Drive games. These have been mega action tested for total playability and addictiveness. They really like that word addictiveness. Next month sees the introduction into the mega library of role playing games. And then so for each of these uh, uh, genres, driving games, sports games, etc., they list games that they think are like, well, these are games that we recommend. And the two things, you know, I looked through this briefly, and the two things that stuck out to me, first of all, under beat-em-up games, the very first game is Budokan, which for my money, Budokan is one of the worst games uh, on the Genesis and Mega Drive. And then they only gave it a 75%. So, like, how are you saying that's really that good of a game when you've got, you know, a, gold, a double dragon is not that great either uh, on the Genesis uh, or Mega Drive. But they've got, like, you know, Golden Axe, Golden Axe 2, Splatterhouse 2, Streets of Rage... Uh, but then up here, if you can see that, it says Streets of Rage 2, and then it says 68%. I hope that's a typo, because if it's not, like, that, that's a serious knock against their credibility. Uh, you know, Streets of Rage 2 should be like a 98%, not a 68%. Uh, so I hope that that is some kind of mistake. And then down here, they've got Strider listed with the shoot 'em ups uh, even though they have other games that are very comparable to Strider, uh, you know, Ghouls and Ghosts, for instance being uh, listed with the platform game. So I, I don't really understand that either, but uh, but whatever. We're almost at the end here. Uh, Mega Drive action coming soon. Uh, here's what's coming up in the next issue, which is really, they don't tell you anything that's coming up in the next issue. Uh, this was one the last thing maybe that I thought was interesting. The Great Games Exchange. I don't remember us ever having anything like that here. Uh, it says, any game for only five pounds. And so it says, just send five pounds with one of your existing games to the address on the coupon opposite, and we will send you your choice of new game. And then, you know, you get to list my first choice, my second choice, my third choice. So, like, you could just take, you know, in theory, any game off your shelf that you were done playing, stick it in an envelope with five pounds, and at some point you would get sent a game back that was going to be one of those three games. But uh, it seems like there'd be no way to make something like that work unless you had a lot of people doing it and some people were sending in, like, really good games. Like, if everybody was sending in, like, you know, really crappy games like Budokan, then you'd never be able to fill these orders. So I just wonder, like, if anybody's watching this, if you did this, I would love to hear about it. And then on the back cover, uh, here's another uh, ad for, I don't know, some kind of... Uh, some kind of video stores, I guess. But uh, so you'll notice, I mean, unless I missed it, it seemed like there were no ads in this magazine from like video game developers or video game publishers. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, you know, I wonder if that was some kind of regulatory thing there. I actually have another magazine, uh, European magazine that I would like to do a read through of soon. It's just called Mega. And, you know, it, of course, is also just a Mega Drive-only magazine. And so I wonder if we'll also not see uh, any of the same kind of advertisements there. Uh, that's pretty interesting. So so that's it for issue number one of uh, Mega Action. Just once again, I want to give a huge thanks to Darren for uh, for sending this in. Uh, that, was, uh, that was pretty cool of you, man. So thank you. I hope that made uh, for a good episode of Let's Read. That's going to do it for this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly. As always, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.